Welcome. This is the Kevin Stoda channel. Um, Kevin Stoda is my name, and I'm sharing this week uh, about memories from World War II. Uh, National Geographic has a special program, I mean, a series of articles on memories of World War II. And today we're focused on memories of Hiroshima. Um, I've been to Hiroshima twice, and the last time was 25 years ago, on the, around the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima. Um, I visited uh, that same city uh, the year before in spring, and I met and had dinner with uh, Hibakushas, that would be people who survived the bombings of Hiroshima. And so Hiroshima is a special place for me. And I'd recommend you go there if you can. Uh, this article is uh, is about people from there, and I'll start off with the uh, article, the part of the article on the Hiroshima that says, "After the bombs fall, after the bombs fall, all uh, Hiroshima was full of uh, miraculous accounts of the services restored, water, electricity, streetcars, and unheralded heroes from the near and far who helped bring the." city back to life in the years afterward. However, for some survivors, the unfounded fears of other Japanese citizens became more of a burden than the after effects of radiation. Can you believe that? The treatment by other Japanese of the Hibakusha and others uh, after the war uh, was shameful. Uh, if you think about it, it'd be like treating them all as leopards. Lepers, not lepers. Shoso Kawamoto was 11 when the bomb fell. He lost his mother, two sisters, and a brother. His surviving sister died of leukemia at 17. Though orphaned, he was fortunate. Uh, Rikiso Kawanaka, the owner of a soy sauce business in Tomo, a village some seven miles from uh, Hiroshima, took him in. Kawanaka fed and clothed Kawamoto. He also... Uh, made him an unusual offer. If the boy agreed to work for 12 years without salary, Kawanaka would give him a house. Years passed. Kawamoto rose at 2 in the morning and worked until 4 in the afternoon, all without pay. When Kawamoto turned 20, he met a woman named Motoko. She was pretty and easy to talk to. She was uh, learning to make uh, dresses and kimonos. They fell in love. When Kawamoto turned 23, Kawanaka made good on his pledge. He gave Kawamoto the promised house. With his own home, Kawamoto felt ready to ask Motoko's father for permission to marry his daughter. But the father knew Kawamoto was from Hiroshima. He told him that any children the marriage might produce could be deformed from radiation. Actually, no health effects have been found in children of Hiroshima survivor or at least very few. Uh, he, in other words, the father forbade the union. Kawamoto was shattered. Two days later, with marriage denied him, as it has been for many Hibaksha, he quit his job, walked away from the house for which he had sacrificed so much, and left the village. He never saw Motoko again and never again allowed himself to love, fearing more heartache. His life spiraled downward. He says he gambled and fell in with gangsters, Yakuza. He considered suicide. Eventually, he found work in a noodle shop, his opportunities limited by his sixth grade education and his status as a hibaksha, a modern day leper to many. At 70, he returned to Hiroshima. At 70 years old, he returned to Hiroshima and there finally found some peace. Now he's 86. He's a grandfatherly figure in a straw hat and a cotton vest. Uh, seeing, reaching into shopping bags and pulling out origami planes and cranes. He gives them to children who visit the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. Pull the tail, he says, beaming and sees the wings flap from the origami. Printed on the plane's wings are the words, hope for peace. 
There is no undoing the discrimination Kawamoto and other survivors suffered after World War II. But at Hiroshima University's Research Institute for Radiation, Biology and Medicine, Director Satoshi Tashiro is determined to try to avoid such future discrimination. The Institute aims to improve communications between the media and scientists so that the public is not swayed by unwarranted fears. What happened to Hibakusha, he says, also happens to those who live near Russia's Chernobyl reactor and uh, Japan's failed Fukushima reactors. The Funeari uh, Mutsumin nursing home houses some 100 bomb survivors now. The youngest, now 74, was in utero at the time of the blast. The oldest is Tsuru Amenomori. She's a 103 years old. When the bomb went off, she was less than a mile from ground zero, giving her bedridden parents medicines. She suffered burns on her face, hand, and leg. Today, she is cheerful and prides herself on bounding up the nursing home stairs. She's a favorite of the staff. These survivors care falls to the Atomic Bomb Survivors Support Division, which has a staff of 32 people, led by Takeshi Yahata, a son of Hibaksha. His grandfather disposed of corpses after the bombing. Now Yahata's division helps living survivors with healthy care, health care, social services, counseling, and uh, nursing home, and funeral expenses. Even now, telling Hiroshima's story can be contentious. A new exhibit at the Peace Memorial Museum took 16 years to complete, partly because of disputes among exhibition committee, says Shuichi Kato, the museum's director and uh, deputy. Uh, some members wanted stark pictures of the horrors of nuclear war. Others argued for more restraint, afraid of traumatizing visitors. During a recent visit, I saw two people collapse in trauma. One debate was over what photos should greet visitors to the museum. It was resolved after Setsunobu Fuji, the son of a survivor, saw a website photo of a young girl, her hand bandaged, her face blood, bleed and bruised. He believed it was his mother, Yukiko Fuji. The museum was able to confirm that it was her at age 10. The committee unanimously chose the photo for the exhibit's entrance. Her photo at age 20 is at the exit. She would die at age 42. They are iconic images, impossible to forget. For many who survived the blast, survivor's guilt and the psychological smears endured include Emiko Okada, 82. She wears a crane medallion around her neck, symbolizing hope and peace. She was eight when the bomb fell. That's That morning, her 12-year-old sister, Mieko Nakasako, announced she was going out. She was headed to within half a mile of ground zero. I asked Okada, whether her sister died in the blast. She says, my elder sister is missing. Missing? I repeat, wondering what that means after 75 years. She has not returned home yet. There is something eerie about the word yet, as if Okada have expected Nakasako to suddenly appear at the door. That lack of resolution haunts Okada. Okada was not orphan, but orphaned, but she may as well have been. Her parents desperately searched for their oldest daughter, abandoning Okada, who found herself living in the streets, sleeping in an air raid shelter, eating what she could find or steal, a discarded tomato, a fallen fig. Only later did her grandmother take her in. Uh, my parents lost their minds after the loss of their daughter, Okada says, when her mother was cremated. She adds pieces of glass that had flown like projectiles that August day, reappeared among her ashes and bone fragments. For Okada and others, the horrors replay themselves even today. Okada hates evening glows, like the sunset when the sky is orange or when the sky is really red, because that reminds me of the night of August 6th, she says. In Hiroshima, the young come to terms with the city's past in their own ways. Kanade Nakahara, 18, studied the bombing in school and in March 2019 went to Pearl Harbor on a field trip. She is determined to work for peace. Others can't relate to that distant period. Near the Bank of Japan, which survived the blast but was where 42 people were killed, I find 17-year-old Kenta, an avid computer gamer. He 
He regards that day as ancient history and isn't sure what year the bomb fell. He guesses 1964. On the other hand, Haruna Kikuno, 18, shudders at the sound of passing planes. The result, she says, of reading books about the bomb as a child. On that flight from Hiroshima to Tokyo, I introduced myself to the Hiyama uh, family. Oh, the author here is Ted Gupp. He's a former reporter of Washington Post and Times. He sees the father, a 44-year-old Akihiro Hiyama. Aki grew up in Hiroshima in a family of prominent political figures. His grandfather, Sodeshiro Hiyama, is honored with a statue for his contribution to Hiroshima's rebirth. Hiyama's maternal grandmother, Keiko Ochiya, told him that a friend of hers had planned to travel the day Hiroshima was bombed but fell ill. Rather than see her train ticket go to waste, she gave it to Ochiya. Soon after the train departed the station, Ochiya looked out the window and saw the mushroom cloud behind her. Her friend did not survive. Today, Ochiya is 91. She married and had a daughter and grandchildren. Grandson Hiyama now lives in the U.S., in Norfolk, Virginia. There in 2005, he met Leah Scheimer. They married and have two children, son Kai, seven, daughter Emmy, five, who uh, hugs her stuffed unicorn in the plane nearby. During the war, Scheimer's grandfather, Sterling Arthur Scheimer, helped design the engines of the B-29 Super Fortress bombers. It was B-29s that rained tens of thousands of tons of explosives down on Japan, as well as incendiary bombs and ultimately the atomic bomb that decimated Hiroshima and later Nagasaki. Between flights, Hiyama, Shimer, and I speak of those warriors. Kai listens, trying to make sense of it all. Mama, he asks, what's a mushroom clown? It falls to Shimer to answer, dust and debris went up into the sky when the bomb went off, she tells him. It was something really sad. A lot of people died. They are sweet, innocent ears, she says later. I'm glad I can be the one to introduce some of this to him. But Kai has one more question. Are America and Japan still enemies? No, his mother says. They are friends. And with that, the family heads for its gate and the long flight home. Well, you should gather stories, if you can, from survivors of uh, World War II or Korean War, uh, Vietnam. Uh, in the Gulf Wars, you need to uh, and pass them on to your uh, children and friends. Thank you for letting me share uh, this set of uh, materials from uh, National Geographic. And to remember, don't forget to support the vets, but end the wars. Okay, this is Kevin Stoda on the Kevin Stoda channel. You have a good day. Give me a thumbs up.